Now everyone, even those that are divorced, want to be in love and probably want to be married. At least most of them do. There was a healthy, well-to-do man in his 50s that was moving into a new condominium. So he parked his Mercedes out front and he was taking stuff out of his car into his condominium and he noticed that there was an older lady across the way that kept watching out her door and out her window and standing in the yard and been watching the whole time as he brings all of his stuff in with some unusual interest she keeps watching. After several hours of him bringing stuff back and forth and doing this and parking and her watching, finally he walked over and he said, I, I see you've been watching me all morning. Is there something wrong? She said, not at all. You just look very much like my fourth husband. He said, really? So how many times have you been married? Well, looking at his Rolex, he says, only three so far. <laughs> Some of y'all get that tomorrow, but <laughs> divorce is so common in our world. Uh, we make jokes, I think, to kind of cover up maybe our fear of it. Wife got so mad at her passive, aggressive husband that she packed his bags for him. And then she said to him, get out. And uh, he said, well, whatever you say, remember he's passive aggressive, whatever you say. So as he started walking out slowly, she yelled at him, I hope you die a long, slow, painful death. And he stopped and he turned slowly and said, wait, are you saying you want me to stay? husband went to a lawyer says I want a divorce my wife hasn't talked to me in six months and the lawyer said wait think about it that kind of woman's hard to get <laughs> we laugh about it because it's you know it's kind of scary uh, people today fear divorce so much so that fewer and fewer people are getting married they're just living together today and because they doubt that marriage still works. God created marriage, and God created us for marriage. And I don't believe he makes anything that doesn't work. Amen? What if marriages fail because we're not following God's rules? What if there are some basic rules that if we followed those very basic rules that might be called laws, we followed those basic rules that more than likely it would ensure, literally ensure, that you're likely to succeed. Makes sense, doesn't it? So I want to give you basically four from the original pattern that if applied should ensure that you got a really good chance to make it work. Number one, it's the law you might call of prioritizing. Genesis 2 24, it says, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother. Prioritizing. In 1 Corinthians 7, verses 33 and 34, it says, he who is married cares about the things of the, wor of the world, how he may please his wife. She who is married cares about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. There has to be a priority. We must prioritize marriage because there are a lot of things pulling at us. It must be the relationship that's number one in our life. It must be above any habit that we might have. It needs to take the focus, not our parents, not our children, not our work, not our hobbies. But we can easily, if we're not careful, let one of those other things become the priority in our personal life. And when that happens, it begins to destroy the marriage that we're in. What are you giving, or rather, what are you giving up for your mate? Now, just think about it just a second. Is there anything that you've given up for your mate, that you've put her or him so high on your list that you just said, I'm not going to worry about that? could be a game. 
I know football's coming up. What if she asked you to quit watching football? What if, I don't think he would ever do that, but what if she asked you? Or a habit. Oh, I could go this way. What if she asked you to quit playing a video game? Uh, what if it was an associate that said, I think you need to stop being around him or her? What if he asked you, that friend you've got, I think is actually causing problems for us. I think you need to give them up. Would you be willing to give up your time? What about your energy, your attitude, or even would you give up your ministry? Hmm. You know, Andy uh, Stanley tells the story about his father, Charles Stanley. A lot of people don't know. You might watch Star Charles Stanley on television. You know, you ever see him? You know he's divorced, right? A lot of you don't know that, right? His wife's name was Anna Stanley. In 19... 95, she divorced him. She sent a letter to her husband's church, expert, the, an excerpt in the local newspaper because it hit big time. It was the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. This is just from it. It formed an article. They literally wrote an article. It was big news in Atlanta. The title of the article was Torn Asunder. And uh, she said that she experienced, quote, many years of dis discouraging disappointments and marital conflict. Charles, in effect, abandoned our marriage. He chose his priorities, and I have not been one of them. Let me assure you, there's only one person that could do it. But if that person asked me to give up the ministry, I quit today. Today. Because I can still be a Christian. I don't have to be a preacher. Amen? That's coming to an end one way or the other anyway, right? Right, don't get too excited. But <laughs> Matthew 16, 26, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? What would a man or a woman give in exchange for a good relationship with their mate? Prioritize. That's the first step, a basic law. If there's anything, fishing, hunting, anything. Oh, I know I got on sacred ground there. Anything, your truck, anything. It comes between you and your mate. Might be time to give it up. Think on it. Second truth. The law of pasting. That's not pasting, that's pasting. In Genesis 2, it goes on to say, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife. Now literally the Greek root there has to do with the idea of gluing. Literally gluing together. To unite, to associate, to cling to, to join in a firm way, as if you were literally pasting things together. 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 3 says, Let the husband render to his wife the affection due her. Likewise, also the wife to the husband. Now, we must do what the other needs. Give them the affection that is due them. You owe it. But it is what they need that day. It takes daily gluing. If you imagine, some of you remember green stamps. You remember green stamps? Some of you remember that. Uh, young people are going, what's that? But green stamp books, how we used to get stuff. We collect enough of them, we could turn them in. Well, imagine if love was like a green stamp book and every day you did a good deed, just what they needed, and you stuck it in. Eventually, it'd pay off, wouldn't it? It would really pay off. So what are you gluing? What are you gluing in every day? How are you gluing yourself together? Are you adding a, at least one good deed a day to glue that rela relationship tighter and tighter? Green stamps or building a love book is done by just gluing one good deed every day. Every day, not once a week, not once a month, but what are you doing today? for your relationship, to glue it together. It isn't something just physical once you did once, but if you want to have a great relationship today, glue one of those little nice things in. After 30 years of marriage, a husband and wife came for counseling. And so the counselor said, well, what's the problem? And the wife started, she started a tirade. I mean, every problem they'd ever had talks about how there was neglect, a lack of intimacy, emptiness, loneliness, feeling unloved and 
feeling unlovable, unmet needs. She went on and on. Finally, he let her talk, let her talk, and finally she kind of got quiet. And so the therapist got up, walked around the desk, and asked her to stand. He put his arms around her and embraced her and held her, and then he gave her a big, long, passionate kiss. The husband's sitting there watching this with grave interest, you know. He's watching all this. And finally, I mean, his eyebrows are up, what's going on? Finally, the woman, when he lets go of her, is just silent. And she sits down just stunned. And the therapist turned to the husband and said, now this is what your wife needs every day. Can you do this? He said, well, doc, I don't know. I could drop her off on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. <laughs> but I go hunting and fishing on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Every day? I don't know about every day. In Exodus 16, 21 through 27, manna fell every day. It had to be gathered every day. You have to do something every day. If you really want to build a relationship, something positive needs to be added every day. You can't go weeks and not do something nice. Go out of your way to say something nice, do something nice, or even give that hug and that kiss. A basic law of marital insurance is the law of pasting in that love stamp to glue you together every day. Number three, it's the law of partaking. In verse 24, it goes on to say in Genesis 2, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Usually that goes into a discussion of intimate things that we're not going to discuss today. In 1 Corinthians 7 verse 4, it says, The wife does not have authority. Listen to me. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Now, I've noticed that that kind of passage and the Ephesians 5.21 passage of submitting to one another kind of gets pushed aside in this authority dominance culture where men like to be the boss of everything. But we must learn to share everything. As Christians, we share everything. That means we share money. We share our things. We share our time. We share our decisions. And we share our authority. It takes a lot of sharing, a lot of cooperation, a lot of selflessness to succeed in marriage. Authority and dominance is also something we both participate in or else somebody's getting stepped on. There has to be a sharing. What are you sharing? Are you sharing any authority or are you the boss? Oh, it doesn't matter which one we're talking about, man or woman. Sometimes somebody just feels like they have to be the one that pushes all the buttons. They have to be the one that has the final say. You can't have a conversation with them. They have to finish the sentence. They have to finish the discussion. They have to be the final word. Is that you? Or is that them and you feel stepped on? You know, there has to be a participation thing. You know, in a body, okay, we're one, right? One body. Have you ever noticed in one body there is one stomach and that one stomach feeds the whole body? So what puts in, you put in, it shares everything with the body. Do you share everything? Or are you the last arbiter on any and everything? You're not going to make it very well if you don't learn to share. There was an old man and his wife walked into a famous restaurant that won't be named. And they ordered a hamburger, fries, and drink. Okay, it's McDonald's. They walk, <laughs> hamburger, fries, and drink. And so after he's ordered it, they both go sit down and he unwraps the burger and then he has a knife in his pocket. He pulls out a knife and he cuts the burger in half. And he sits half the burger in front of her 
And then he takes the fries and he counts them out and he separates them one at a time, one for me, one for you, till he gets down to the last, even, even dividing the last fry. You know, between them two, puts one in front. They have one drink. And so he takes a sip, puts it in front of her, she takes a sip. They are sharing everything. And then the people sitting in this famous restaurant look around and they feel sorry for them because they're like, that's all they've got? They only have enough for one Happy Meal and that's it? And so they're whispering around, that, that poor old couple, all they can afford is one meal for the two of them as they watch them. The man began to eat his fries and when he finished the fries he began to eat his burger now she's just sitting there she's not eating and and he finishes his burger and the people around him, finally a young man steps over and says can i buy another meal for so you can have two meals and 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 the man says no 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 we share everything so don't worry about it we're fine and so he finishes his fries up and then somebody else steps over and says can can i buy you another meal and the lady this time says no 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 we share everything finally he finishes his hamburger he finishes his fries and he's drunk about half the drink and there another man steps up and says really can can I buy for you and the, the lady share says no we, we share everything she says well what are you waiting on then he says the teeth we share everything the teeth. I don't know if that's what I'm talking about in this point, but I will say this. There should be pleasure for both. One person doesn't get to have the fancy truck while the other one doesn't have anything. One doesn't get the boat while the other one doesn't get anything, doesn't even get a new dress. One doesn't get all the dresses while the other guy has to walk to work. We share. In Exodus chapter 21, verses 10 and 11, a man could not double his portion of what he was using and the wife get cut. If that happened, she could divorce him. You can't cut somebody out of the equation. We partake of it all. You can't make all the decisions and ignore her input. You can't make all the decisions and ignore his input. We partake together, amen? That's how marriage works. I didn't hear very loud amen, which means we got work to do here, but we partake a basic law of marital insurance is the law of partaking. We are to be one. To be one means we have one stomach that feeds us all. We are to be participating in it all. Maybe skip the teeth, but everything else. Last point. The law of purifying. In verse 25, it goes on to say, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Innocence and openness is a beautiful thing. In fact, the Bible says it's undefiled, Hebrews 13, verse 4. In Ephesians 5, verses 26 and 27, it says that he, this is talking about Jesus, might sanctify and cleanse her, that is the church, with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself. A glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. We must learn to be naked. And I'm not talking about without clothes, although it applies. We must learn to be naked, exposed, open, intimate, without fear or without guilt before our mates. That takes a lot of honesty. It takes being faithful. See, you can't tell your mate everything if you're fooling around on the side, now can you? You have to lie. If you're actually lusting after somebody else's wife, you can't tell your wife that. Right? You have to keep that from her because she won't want to hear that, right? But if you are open, you can be faithful and be open. And you can be careful and you can be kind and sensitive with our words and with our actions. That's what real purity is. And our relationship should be that kind of pure. That there really should not be a problem being absolutely naked, spiritually, emotionally, psychologically. We should be able to be open, admitting our faults, admitting our flaws, accepting our 
faults and flaws before each other. Yes, I have faults. Yes, I have flaws. And admitting those things, there's where there's real nakedness. That's where there's real openness. A preacher was visiting a home of one of his members. And he went and he, it seemed obvious somebody's there. The car was there. It sounded like he could hear a TV in there. And he knocked nothing. Knock nothing. Finally, he took out his business card and he wrote on there that he'd come by and he wrote Revelation 3 and verse 20. Now, if you look up Revelation 3, 20, it says, Behold, I stand at the door, knock. And he wrote that on. He thought that'd be cute. Put it in the door and then he left. The next Sunday, as they pass a plate after church, he found his card in the plate. And in the plate, it had another scripture written on it. And it was Genesis 3 and verse 10. And it, then he didn't know what that said, so he looked it up. Genesis 3 and verse 10. I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid for I was naked. So, I didn't come out because it's naked. So we can't be naked in front of everybody. We can't, I can't tell you all my works. So some of you would use it against me. And some of us would use it against you. But in a marriage, there ought not be that kind of thing. Amen? We should be able to be absolutely honest, absolutely open. James 5, 16. We, in the church, it really ought to be that we could because we expose our souls, our faults. Pray one for another. Confess your faults one to another. And pray one for another. Where best should that happen than in a home where you pray for each other? In marriage, there should be no need to fear and no need to be ashamed. So basic law of marital insurance is the law of purifying. So that's basically the lesson today in the prioritizing is seen in what we give and give up. The pasting happens when we glue in a new good deed every day. The partaking is in sharing all good things, even authority. And the purifying is seen in is exposing and forgiving each other's flaws and faults. One day at work, this is a true story, uh, and you don't say that very often, but I read it online, so it has to be true. So Amanda received a beautiful bouquet of flowers from her husband. There were 11 flowers, and I don't know the significance of 11, but there were 11 flowers in it, and a short note is written in beautiful lettering, and it said, my love for you will last until the day the last flower in this bouquet dies. Well, it was a note from her husband, but he just went on a trip. So he's out of town, so he really couldn't talk to her, I guess for a cell phone, so he, she's like, well, that's kind of an odd thing to say. And so she thought, hey, I'm gonna make sure these flowers last until at least gets on. And so she took the flowers home after work, she doused them in water and she took care of them every day. But as you know, daily those flowers began to wilt a little bit until all but one flower was dead. And it was then that she realized that that was a fake flower and it would never die. You know, marriages last because of two iron wheels. You listen to me? Not wheels against each other, but will to stay together. It takes two people, both making a commitment that they will not give up on each other. Whether it's things are up or whether things are down, whether it's a good day or whether it's a bad day, whether they're sick or whether they're healthy, whether we have riches or whether we have poverty. We make iron will commitments to each other that we will not turn back on no matter what. Amen? That's how it works. And that's such that iron will commitment that says, I won't give up even when I'm not really all that much enjoying what's going on. That's the kind of commitment that made a promise to send Jesus into this world. I will love you. I will show you I love you. It's not going to be fun for me. Everything's not going to go well. They're going to hang me on a cross and I'm going to die. But I am committed to you to show you my love no matter what. That's what Christ did for you. He calls us to do that for our mates.
That's an easy thing to do, and yet it's a hard thing to do. Amen? And we must do it every day. If He made that kind of commitment to you, you should make that commitment to your mate, but more than that, you should be willing to make that kind of commitment to the Lord Jesus to not only believe, but to repent and confess His name and be baptized and not just do that, but to faithfully follow Him the rest of your life. Is it going to be easy? No. Sometimes it's going to be really hard. But sometimes it's going to be just as easy as it can be. If you want to be one of us, that's what we call you to do. Won't you come if you need to while we stand, while we sing?